Welcome to Happy Times and Places, in which I, Toby Haydock, endeavour to accentuate the positive about a Doctor Who story chosen by a friend of mine. Sandra Allard here. You want to know what story I've nominated for you to watch, and it's The Rescue. Well, you can come in. Uh, it's episode two of The Rescue. In Haydock Towers, it's 20 past three in the morning. This plague is doing funny things, but do you know what? I couldn't sleep, and I thought I'd watch Doctor Who, and it's the first one I'm doing with my other half, out of shot, out of earshot too. Uh, so, um... Yeah, she's but she's been asleep. She was working very hard. It is episode two of the rescue. Please press play now. Um, this is the first Hartnell I've done for this project. So much respect to the work of well, Bernard Lodge did the letters. He gets credited for the title sequence, but actually the. The signal howl around here was done in an experimental session. Uh, Norman Taylor was one of the technicians. He discovered how to do signal howl around. Um, ben Palmer was one of the other BBC technicians. He was the person in charge of the session doing the title sequence. I think it, as an abstraction of travelling through time and space, it's a work of absolute magic uh, and might actually be my favourite title sequence in the whole um, Tom Baker's first one maybe but it's pretty close I like the, uh, it's clever isn't it because the set, you know that big face on the uh, I remember my brother coming in and laughing at this bit because he said if they were really sharp they'd have cut the jacket um, I don't like older brothers, they spoil things because <laughs> that hadn't occurred to me um I'd, I'd, I'd found the, the sword slightly wobbly, but um, uh, their sharpness hadn't... The sharpness not being dulled by uh, Savile Row <laughs> hadn't occurred to me. Um, uh, yeah, but I, the, the big face, it's like Aquilian's face, isn't it? So there's a sort of continuity of, of, of design for all, all the reliquary of the planet Dido, where as <laughs> the Doctor Who music, the Doctor Who years... Oh, which is another thing about which I will wax lyrical at some point. Uh, the Doctor Who years um, thing that Ed Stradling and Peter Crocker put together. They say that it comes from the planet Dido, where the, where the dull music comes from or something, which I would laugh at, but I'd then actually go, well, I actually quite like a lot of Dido songs. Um, but it's easy to be disparaging, isn't it? Um, but it's a, it's a nice joke. It's a good joke. <laughs> um so what was i talking about uh and of course yes uh, ray barrett i was very pleased that because they got him for the dvd he'd moved back to australia by the time the dvd was done uh, and he died not long after but uh, i think was it damien shanahan intrepidly went out and, and got an interview with him so he, he he chats on the dvd which is absolutely lovely uh Always good to hear from the guest stars, uh, especially if somebody as illustrious as Barrett, who is one of Australia's finest sons, and of course he was one of the many voices in Thunderbirds. He was a great voice man, uh, which I guess is why one of the reasons he was sort of thought of for the for the dual role is that he was able to give a different vocal performance. Uh, Yes, he's yes, he's passing himself off as, as somebody that's been sort of disabled in an accident, but it's all a sham. He's he's an early as because unfortunately people are still prone to uh uh you know, make the disparaging observation that uh you know, some disabled people are faking it for the benefits. Uh, so I'm afraid that only that only serves to underline that. Uh, appalling and overused slur. So that's that's why I can't go back to his own planet because the Department of Work and whoever it is 
would be on his case. He'd be having to do a pip assessment. Poor old Bennett. They go. Well, we we find you're fit to uh, disguise yourself as <laughs> as an alien creature. That's a great shot from behind. Uh, Sandy the sand creature in the uh, in the cave. Now Sandy the sand creature is played by Tom Sheridan, who's also the voice of the uh, space captain who um, who who we hear from but never see. And you feel a bit sorry because you hear them coming and they're coming to. To, to rescue but um, of course as the story turns out when they well we don't know if they turn back because the, the radio gets smashed but uh, it's an it's an unrequited journey I totally believed uh, that that was very good um, it's a big old torch, isn't it? Is that a normal torch that they've augmented to make it a space torch? That's that's a legitimate thing to do. But of course, what we would do now is make it smaller. Whereas in those days, to make something bigger made it more sort of space age. Whereas actually what the future was all about was, was condensing things. Um, from the length of television series to, you know, the size of our phones. That's a great... Uh, that's a great shot of first being able to see Vicky from from the inside. Oh, but this, and, uh, oh, and uh, she hurt herself doing this. Uh, uh, Jacqueline Hill. She yeah. Look, you can see it catches her. Um, which I, I mean, she sort of deserves it for killing Sandy the sand beast. I hate that bit. It's really sad. It's the death of an innocent creature. So it turns out it was a it was a bogus. Oh well, no, because he was going to get. Who's going to fall off the edge anyway? Oh, poor old Sandy the Sand Beast. Yeah, so actually, Barbara, for all your travelling in space and time, you see an alien creature with an alien face and you think it's bad. Oh, it's horrible. I find that quite unbearable. That's really sad. And Maureen O'Brien does it very well. I think it's one of the most pointless deaths in the whole of Doctor Who, and I don't mean in terms of the story. It helps the story very much, but it, it leaves a really sad and unpleasant uh, taste in the mouth, that. That's great. I, yeah, I know. I'm glad I chose Kakillian's mask. It's a brilliant mask. Uh, I don't quite know why your ceremonial robes of Dido need you to have spiky feet as well. But... Uh, that's a great shot, isn't it? I like the spaceship. And Hartnell's great at this sort of not paternalistic, grand paternalistic stuff with Vicky. I'm, I mean, is I can I meant to look that up. Is Cocky Licking a a regular sort of nickname that you give somebody? Because um, I'm not sure it's one that's aged particularly well. It's, 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 it's as risque as Doctor Who ever gets. Cockalicky is a sort of soup, but cocky licking is a uh, well. Could be seen as a a risque pastime. Yeah, she's quite right. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite nice seeing the TARDIS crew, who we know are the good guys. Um, you know, you can come in with good intentions and actually <laughs> you just ruin somebody's day. Hartnell, I love the fact that Hartnell... Because, of course, we, we forget we're only a year in and the Doctor has often been a figure of mystery and, in fact, aggravation. But here, having lost his granddaughter, Hartnell's so good in this, you can imagine him being a lovely granddad. Um and the way he dismisses them, I love the way he dismisses them, and sort of says, "I'll take care of this. I, I, I'll, I'll sort the young lady out." Yeah, he's. You can tell why he sort of, he cast a spell over. Children, which of course, which of course he did, even though he's set up as an anti-establishment figure, he does have that. 
I, th- I think Hartnell gets. I- I've interviewed so many people who go, "Oh yeah," and of uh, and of course, you know, w- w- William Hartnell was was grumpy, and I think he, he he probably was. But I think often his doctor suffers as a result of that is that people think because he could be a bit grumpy that his doctor was always sort of grumpy. And not everybody I've interviewed said he was grumpy, but quite quite a few. Um, but his his doctor's actually often not grumpy at all, and is is actually rather sweet. I also love his Rupert Bear trousers. I'd love to be bold enough to wear a pair of trousers like that. You, you probably wouldn't love me. <laughs> Looks could kill. <laughs> this podcast series would be over now. Uh, apparently, I I won't be getting a pair of William Hartnell trousers uh, for my lockdown Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh yes. By the way, uh, this was recorded at Riverside Studios. Uh, just I wanted to I wanted to clear that up. Riverside Studio One. Uh, so I think my initial instinct was correct um so the doctor's gonna go and have chat with uh ray barrett who's gonna say can't come in that was pre-recorded that bit you could tell because they use it so often I, I, I quite like the fact that the doctor doesn't take you can't come in for an answer and goes oh well, I'll, I'll just break the door down <laughs> break the door down then and of course, Bennett doesn't say anything else. Uh, oh, and it's dark outside now, uh, which I rather like. I do like darkness really does. A, black and white really helps, though, doesn't it? Black and white's glorious. Uh, oh, go on, Barbara. You and Vicky. Oh, well, I suppose Vicky's got to... Don't you... She doesn't really have to... No, you don't really have to apologise. Barbara killed your pet. Yeah, but she nonetheless she killed your pet. I think you're allowed to be sad. Oh, you know that thing we watched the other day uh, out of half other shot with that young man in that American series about the lawyer. He's his son. Yeah. Uh, we were watching Alfred Enoch, who is the son of William Russell, because William Russell's real name is Russell Enoch, uh, who is having a marvellous career uh, in the UK and in the States. And I love the fact, and I know it's got really nothing to do with Doctor Who, but I do see, because it's the next generation of a Doctor Who actor, uh, I do see him sort of holding, hold, he does in a way, hold the torch for Doctor Who. Uh, And I'm sure, I'm sure uh, it's only so long before he'll end up in Doctor Who himself. Look, I I love the way Barbara just jabbed Ian. Oh, and his pocket squares come in useful. He's... Aren't they great, these two? Barbara and Ian have to get married. By the way, <laughs> now he's got a big girder. To, yeah, there you go. That's what you tend to do when somebody says you can't come into my bedroom. You kick the door in. Uh, but of course, he's not there because it's a tape recording. But the angle, doesn't it? The angle really works. Now, I've got to try and work out what. Uh, clever threads and things Andrew is going to choose as his favourite thing. I mean, I'm liking the whole thing. Uh, And I'm assuming that, yeah, that activates when you try and open the door. So it's quite a clever setup that he's got um, in order to sneak off and disguise himself as Kikillian. Um, Oh, of course, because he's... his his plan actually does make sense. I think I was 
disparaging of it in part one, but it does actually make sense. It makes total sense. Um, but I think it didn't originally. I think they had to they had to work on it that his motives weren't clear. Oh, look at that. That was quite neat. The the, the he's got a hole. He's got a trap door in his floor, uh, which is why Vicky, who will not make the next Miss Marple, uh, why when Kakillian went into Ben Bennett's bedroom, uh, he 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 didn't come out again. You can't come in. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's gone, Ian. Gone. Yep. So, uh, yes, because he's got, he's got the under... Oh, I like the moss on the cave walls. It's Raymond Cusick, isn't it, designing this? So, oh, this is a great set. I love, I love the smoke and the... The atmosphere of this. Oh, and the music, of course, is Tristram Carey's music uh, that was also used in the Daleks. So, um, nice bit of sort of... It's, I think it's quite nice to have a music that recalls a previous adventure, especially because it all sort of ties it in with this, this early era. And it's a really good score. It's a really odd discordant disconcerting alien score i wish i i wish i could describe music better i'm not a musical person at all so what are ah, now i could could i choose the score he's not going to andrew's not going to choose the score is he he's going to choose something thematic he's a writer uh, i'm a, i'm a, i'm a writer I should be able to. I should be able to trust this. Is, that's a great shot. And look at all of the acting Hartnell is doing with his face. Not overacting, but what he's doing is 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 going. There's a lot going on underneath what his face is doing. He's a good actor. We un, we underestimate Hartnell at our peril. Uh, yeah. And the, yeah, the righteous, righteous indignation bubbling along there, Doctor. Yeah, you've you knew who it was, because you've seen the cast list and you know there's only one suspect. <laughs> but that's okay. It's uh, he's a sort of. I mean, nowadays you'd call Bennett a sort of. He's a sort of gaslighter, isn't he? Because he's sort of making Vicky feel guilty and beholden and all sorts of other things. Having C C Killian come in and bully her uh, so that she's grateful to to Bennett uh, and, then, and then serve as his advocate when... Yeah, and he's, he's com he commits genocide in order to cover himself up he's a ba actually we don't think of it because it, it's this story is sort of small stakes and introducing Vicky he kills all of the people from the earth rocket and the entire population of Dido he's as bad as bad as a Doctor Who baddie gets uh, but also his, his work his clear up rate's pretty good in the uh, in, in the murderer's ledger Uh, but also there's a nice subtext there about, you know, it's easy to sell to Earth people, humans, us, to go, well, it was, we landed on this alien planet, all these guys who looked, all these aliens, they're, they're bad. Oh, yeah, I forgot, Hartnell gets quite, uh, he has a bit of a scrap. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and, and because that, that's, yeah, he, he turned the dial up. I'd never seen that quite so clearly before. He turns the dial up because it's, it's like a sort of energy weapon in the staff, isn't it? Uh, but look, this is, oh, this is great. Oh, because he gets a fight in the Romans in the next story as well. But that's, that's pretty good. Ah, that now these, these are the survivors of Dido. Um, he, thought he thought he killed you all, but he hasn't. Um, 
And uh, one of these, I've noticed, I checked on IMDb, one of these is called John Stewart. There's a silent film actor called John Stewart, had a great career and carried on acting till after this, 1979. Uh, and for, and IMDb used to have the, the, jo the John Stewart, who's one of these, uh, was the same person. Definitely not. And I've seen it argued in Doc 2 forums, well, it could just have makeup on because John Stewart would have been in his late 60s at this point, perhaps, it, yeah, late 60s. Uh, not, no way. And you get people on forums go, well, it could be makeup. No, it's not. I, I remember uh, there was a thing on a forum for years going that George, because IMDb had got George Pastel's birth date wrong and they were and somebody suggesting that no he would have been in his he might have been in his 80s in tomb of the side men and it was just makeup no uh but somebody i think has fought that battle because john stewart is now not credited at all uh on imdb uh they, i think they've removed the credit rather than have to keep updating the film star john stewart's page to go he's not been in doctor who but some sources will still say that uh, that it's 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 that John Stewart, which it wasn't, uh, and you could, and I know, uh, equity doesn't allow two people to have the same name, but you could you could you could do walk on work and stuff without necessarily having an equity card, and I'm guessing that's what's happened here. But I've never found we've never found either of the the Didonians because John. I think they call. I think the other one's called Colin Hughes. You try finding actors called John Stewart and Colin Hughes. That neither of those four words are uncommon, uh, especially if, uh, as we, you know, we think they might. At least one of them might not have been a member of Equity. We actually only found. Well, we. I didn't. Chuck. Cor I think it was Stephen Griffiths, who's one of the handful of uh, Doctor Who uh, actor seekers. Uh, found Tom Sheridan, the space captain, had, had died, I think, in 2009, 10, 11, 12, something less than 10 years ago. But we never, we yeah, for ages, we got no leads on, on that actor either. Uh, so, it's going to be nice to have Vicar. So, I, yes, I did... There is something to be said for doing Doctor Who chronologically because when Vicky comes in, it's great because you go, ah, oh, I look forward to seeing what she'll be like and she's great. Obviously, the next story I'm going to watch is uh, is going to be some random. Um, now, I've got to... Um, I've got to choose two things that I like about this, whereas Andrew is going to choose three because he gets two per episode and one bonus one, whereas I only get the two... I only get the two per episode. Um, oh, it's a difficult one. Uh, especially thinking what story beats uh, Andrew will choose. He might, I mean, he might choose the idea of Vic the fact that Vicky becomes the, the companion and that the TARDIS crew have rescued. Ah, well, I'm definitely going to choose, I think, the bit... Where Hartnell sends, she, oh, she's lovely, isn't she? She's got a lovely, cheerful face. Um, definitely gonna. This is quite sad because this, the the voice of Sandy the Sand Beast. Uh, neither of those men are in their late sixties. Sorry, IMDb, not IMDb. They've taken it off now. Um, but yeah, I, the the poor spaceship captain. Uh, do, do, would they have given up? Do you think now that the ship's radio has been disabled, or would they would they turn up and get murdered by the people of Dido in revenge for the fact those two blokes? No wonder they're not speaking because they don't speak. <laughs> no wonder they're not talking to each other. They're the only two left. Um, I, I am going to choose definitely uh, Hartnell's dismissal of Ian and Barbara and oh didn't explain that um, explain the cliffhanger from the previous episode as we go into the cliffhanger from the next episode this is a great shot by the way this was because um, the Romans and the rescue were the same production block so this was done in the filming uh, which is great the TARDIS falling off a cliff to lead into the next bit it's lovely I love that um, uh, uh, this it was this I, I explained to my other half um, how how we would remember our new neighbours' names because about five doors down 
uh, and the only time we're going, I'm going out in lockdown is to do the shopping for our elderly neighbours five doors down because they're called Ian and Barbara. <laughs> So, uh, and I said to my, I said to Jess, I said, it's very easy to remember their names. They've got the same names as Doctor Who's first two companions. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm definitely going to choose um, the bit where Hartnell, excuse me, um, sends Ian and Barbara out. And I suppose the other bit, because I think it's effective, even though I don't, I don't think I like it. I think it might have to be the. I was because I was gonna. I think it would be cheeky, but I, to to choose the fact that Bennett is perhaps the most effective mass murderer in the history of Doctor Who. Um, but that only occurred to me when I was watching it and thinking of something funny to say. Um, I think the sec the thing I will choose that I I don't like but I think is effective is the death of Sandy the Sand Beast. So Doctor Who sending out uh, Ian and Barbara and being so lovely uh, to Vicky uh, and the tragic death at the hands of the murderer Barbara Wright of Vicky's pet. What will Andrew have chosen? Let's find out. In episode two, I really like Barbara killing Sandy, the creature yes. Vicky's befriended. Not because I'm a bloodthirsty animal murderer, but because it stops the outcome of this episode being a foregone conclusion. Everyone knows this is the new companion story, but that outcome seems a lot harder to reach when Barbara murdered Vicky's only friend. <laughs> it's a clever obstacle to add to the story. Thing two. Episode two sees the arrival of two mute Didonians. And I love everything about how this plays out. They reveal that they look human, to a which is a surprise to us. They reveal that they're alive, which is a shock to Bennett. And they're all dressed in white, like ghosts. They're the haunting remains of the crimes Bennett committed. He must have the single highest death rate of any villain in the show so far. And they haunt him to his death, silently, only ever moving forward. It's a big Jacques Hughes finale, a, a big Doctor Who courtroom scene, and they don't stop there. Once Vicky's gone, they smash up the rocket, making sure their civilization will remain unfound by the humans who follow. It's quietly anti-colonial, and it's brilliant. My overall big favourite thing about this episode must be one that you guessed. It's the full-blooded, do you want to come with me story. I mean, listen to the Doctor here. He said, my dear, why don't you come with us, hmm? We can travel anywhere and everywhere in that old box, as you call it, regardless of space and time. And if you like adventure, my dear, I can promise you an abundance of it. Apart from all that, well, you'll be among friends. Why isn't that memed and clipped endlessly? I have absolutely no idea. It's gorgeous. And the whole story is about Vicky's journey. It feels like a big influence uh, on Russell T. Davis's Rose. We start in the middle of Vicky's life, a life from which she clearly needs rescuing. Take away the sci-fi trappings and it's a girl imprisoned by her wicked stepfather. Who better to turn to than school teachers and the local doctor? Come the end, she can take the rescue ship home or she can travel with the doctor. She's not stuck uh, having to hitch a lift. One choice is safe, though perhaps it's the kind of choice that one makes if they're scared and scarred. But instead she chooses, she chooses to grow past her recent nightmare and become an adventurer. What a marvellous way to become the first truly willing companion. Oh, he was a good choice of guest, wasn't he? I knew he would be. Uh, he, I, I was quite moved by his, uh, his, his uh, quotation of the Doctor's words, and he's quite right. Uh, it's not. It's, it's never quoted that uh, big speech that he gives to Vicky, but it it's a sort of sums up Doctor Who. Um, and thanks to Andrew for shedding. That's that's been a surprise to this, you see, because I, you know, I hope it's that diverting and that you feel like you're you've come round and we're putting our feet up and shooting the shizzle and talking about Doctor Who. I'm doing most of the talking. Sorry. Um, but actually, the, the other people, the people who've set the challenge, who've chosen the story, um, the perspectives that they bring in, uh, partially because of just who they are, but also, as Andrew demonstrates, because of his profession and because of his insights and is able to sort of categorise uh, how scripts, you know, what scripts do and how they work and to 
uh, uh, bring his own experiences to bear on his on how he takes the episode uh, and how he, he interprets it and how it's filtered through his experience and his profession and his skills that's to me been a real it's been really exciting for, for me and I, I hope as much for you to hear the, you know the reasons that these other people have i really enjoyed listening to what andrew said he sometimes i do tend to ask the guests to sort of point out where they are online and things like that uh elard ent at elard ent on twitter is his twitter handle he's currently uh in charge of a sci-fi children's series being filmed in belfast as we speak for the bbc which uh if his scripts are anything like as, as good as his forensic examination of other people's uh, and he's done loads of script editing work he's been working on a comedy here with a comedian called sophie willen uh, who i've worked with who's absolutely brilliant and her she's done a pilot and that's going to series and andrew's been working on that so check out his work i hope his contribution to this has inspired you to check out his stuff because uh, that will be another good thing that has happened as a result of Doctor Who and all of our experience with it. I hope, if nothing else, the rescue has rescued half an hour of your life that otherwise would have been slightly duller. That's all I aim for, to be better th than dull. <laughs> or better than not as dull as full-on dull. So um, thanks for joining me. Uh, do attend one of the next ones of these, but let's uh, let's go all off uh, for another journey, and then we'll reconvene where here on my sofa, where remember you're amongst friends. Ta ta. Thanks for listening to Happy Times and Places with me, Toby Haydock. My special guest was Andrew Ellard. Sincere thanks to this episode's featured patrons, Rob Leonard, Andy Case, James Gould, David Matthewman, John Rivers, Rich Wiggins, Michael Williams and Stephen White. The music for this podcast is by Dave Gates and the artwork by Dylan Patterson. Join me at my next happy time and place and you'll never suffer from the scringes ever again because that's right, we will find ourselves undergoing the Reboss Operation. Don't forget to subscribe and to please rate this five stars wherever you happen to pick up your podcasts. That sort of thing really does help. Oh, and subscribe to my YouTube channel too. You can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke or make a one-off donation at ko-fi.com forward slash Toby Haydoke. Thank you so much. Oh.